Hi, and welcome to the first dive into Reiki Roundtable. I'm very, very excited about this. I have three wonderful guests who will introduce themselves. I just gonna preamble, this is our first round table. So we're really planning to have fun, be real, and bear with me because it's the first time I interview three people. So a lot of compassion towards myself. And I'll hand it, and I'll go in terms of my screen. So Anya, you're the first next to me on my screen. Then Yolanda, and then Tamika, if you can introduce your wonderful selves uh, to the viewers. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. And this is exciting. The first round table, people connecting around the world. Great. Perfect. I was a bit nervous if, if it's on time because the time changed today in the Netherlands, but uh, great. Um, I'll be short about myself. Uh, I am Anja van Til, uh, born in Kazakhstan, lived in Russia, uh, and currently living in the Netherlands. Um, have learned Reiki in Russia, back in Russia, and I was fortunate to learn it from the, from the traditional teacher, Usui Reiki Ryoho. And uh, uh, just uh, continued that, smoothly continued that education here in Europe with Franz Tina. And here in Europe, I started already my uh, little school and I'm teaching Reiki and meditation. And in Holland, uh, also I added Aikido training to it, which helps me to more embody it actually, to get it deeper with my body. Um, uh, further, I am a mother of three children, three teenagers. So, it, you know, enough, <laughs> enough to apply my <laughs> Reiki on a daily basis. So here I am to talk about challenges. Oh, yeah. I'm really grateful you said yes. And just for the people watching this, Aikido is a martial art that is about harmonizing. So that just as a quote, in case no one knows what Aikido is. Thank you. Yeah. Yolanda. Hi. Hi, I am Yolanda Williams. Um, I, what do I even say about me? I don't know. Um, I host Reiki Radio. I also studied with Franz, Franz and um, Arjava. I consider my two main teachers, although I've had several teachers throughout the years and continue to learn from everyone. Um, I'm very excited to be here, to be in the very first round table. Can't wait to have this conversation. And I love all of the discussions with you, Natalie. So I'm really looking forward to today. And thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Tamika. Peace, beautiful souls. So I always have to introduce myself with all this energy, all this love, all this light that my grandma always told me to sit down somewhere, honey, because you do too much. So <laughs> I am Tamika from beautiful Beaufort, South Carolina. See, this Reiki world was introduced to me a long time ago, but I never had a word for it. So my master teacher is nature. I also come from the lineage of a master teacher who is a fatal white, who was a beautiful sunshine walking through Walmart and I had this moment where I was looking for self and I was able to see a reflection of that so that was my introduction into Reiki um, short brief and simple I am a Reiki master teacher here in Beaufort South Carolina and I also have a holistic wellness center which is energy evolution um, it's my baby it's the way I give back it's the way I am able to really be able to connect and bridge the gap which I didn't have in my childhood and sometimes the older folks they don't know how to talk about this stuff so that's me in a nutshell I'm just excited to be able to be on this first one because I know it's many to come because this is the time for us to be able to speak about energy um, and I'm honored to talk about it at a universal level so thank you so much for having me thank you the three of you and I want to keep it simple in terms of question today because you know Obviously, when we start talking, uh, what one person says may spark something else. But I think we often talk about Reiki practice, uh, but we seldom talk about the challenges of teaching, right? I think in Reiki, we always like this perfection, everything flows, the energy, the love. But teaching Reiki is actually challenging both in practical terms, but also even like how do you communicate this very abstract experience that also very individual, yes, very interconnected experience. So the first topic I would love to, to tackle is 
What is most challenging in the terms of communicating what Reiki practice is or some of the elements are? And I don't know who wants to start this thread of the conversation. I'm like, I'm opening to the house, raise your hand and go for it. <laughs> the three of you are smiling like a... Uh... Well, I can start. I think one of the most challenging things um, over the years in communicating it has been uh, language, <laughs> really, because it's hard to articulate a lot of what it is and what you will experience. And so I always like to, in the classes, of course, give the basics and the foundations of what it is that it may mean. Um, but I am much more of an experiential teacher. I like you to go into experience. So have different practices and exercises to help people feel into what this is so that they can translate it for them. But I would say, and that's not really a challenge as much as I enjoy it, but that's how I overcome the challenge of language. I think what has been more challenging for me um, has been the adaptation through the years. So as I've changed and evolved in my practice and then my teachings then have to change and adapt with my practice. And so it has been a, an interesting journey of um, tailoring the classes to mirror my own growth and you know, wanting to go back to students from years ago and say like, oh, and there's one more thing. But yeah, I think one of the biggest challenges is just simply language. And there's so much online now. I mean, with social media, there's so many different points of view, perspectives. And so people come in with a lot of expectations and even confusion. So yeah, I like to give experience. I, I love that. The confusion for me personally, that's one of the biggest, like what people think Reiki is versus, you know, what you may be teaching in a class. Right. Thank you. And I never thought about your challenge of like wanting to tailor them. So I really appreciate that you brought it because I'm like, oh, I never, I never even yeah. thought of that. So I may have to revise and do some work as well. I love that. Tamika, you wanted to say something and you look like you're like wanting to talk. Yeah, about that. because this one was near and dear to me. Um, the reason why I always talk about the challenges when I first start, because people come in, once again, like Yolanda says, there's so much on the internet. You know, most people, when they come in, they have an awakening moment and they're like, what the heck is happening to me? And in where I'm from, um, where I'm located, Reiki is not a word that's used universally. It's, we talk about the spirit, and you know, that's why I always share that with my students because of us being in this space culturally, um, it's not something that we are taught about. Um, so the challenge for me is to bring it into this realization that we all have this universal energy within us. So that's the grounding, that's the foundation of it. Because when you bring the simple aspects of that to them, um, it it's real, it's real, it gets raw. And that's when the tears start flowing. It's like, oh my gosh, it's this simple. And those aha moments just, when you get to that space, when you remove the um, the structures all the time, sometimes when you allow your students to allow them to flow into why they even came, because that is one of the challenges when you have a manual in front of you and you're a Reiki master teacher. And when I first started, I was like, I got to go through all of this. And then when you look into the student's eyes, the challenge is, are they even getting this? You know, how can they take this back into their daily lives and apply it to their lives? So it gets that real for me. So that was my biggest challenge. That is always my challenge to make sure when they leave that they're not leaving with a packet with, with just information, but they have applied knowledge that they can use in their daily lives. And thank you so much for sharing that because I think that is a real challenge. As you say, like, understanding this is a practice for your daily life, not just an experience that you had for two days. And I think making that real for them to experience like Yolanda is doing like through your work as well is what we need to do because I wish I had a study, like there must be like 90% drop. They do Reiki for a month and then they drop it, right? If we teach them to integrate, they may last two months. <laughs> no, I'm just joking, <laughs> but it may last more. Anya, how is it for you? What is the one thing that comes to you when it's like you're thinking of challenges? Well, I agree, absolutely agree with the, with the language uh, challenge. 
but for me, it also evolved kind of. It, what started with um, indeed a language challenge, like how do I explain it in Reiki? How do I make it sound real? How do I make it sound something like a tool for everyday life? How do I make it sound simple to people? How do I say it uh, at a party, you know, not in a class, but how do I explain it at a party to somebody who's, you know, had a glass of wine and is not prepared <laughs> to sit and listen for the whole day <laughs> and not, not, not uh, go practice and go uh, meditate or whatever. So that was a challenge, uh, number one. So it was, you know, I was trying to uh, put my experience into it and reading and, you know, searching for words, especially for me, because I'm not uh, teaching in the native language. So for me, yes, uh, it's an extra challenge. But uh, after that, I also thought, okay, I am not going to speak too much. I'm going to let people experience. And that's, that's great. Experiences are great uh, for me too and for, for uh, people in a class, uh, for example. But now I'm kind of at a place where I'm trying to find the good words for all the experiences. How do I you know, apply all the, 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 the deeper experiences uh, in, in, into words, find the, the words that would touch the heart, touch, penetrate, you know, not come through the head, but through the heart. Something like that, I think. And, and to find the words for everybody individually, because, you know, it's not universal. Everybody comes and everybody has a different level, a different background, a different heritage, whatever. And, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm kind of experimenting with that. And that I think that's, just, that's a task for the rest of the life. <laughs> uh, there is a common thread between the three of you that I like, and is that word of experimenting and being open to, uh, open to adjust, right? Mm -hmm. And that is something that I think is very important because a lot of times this is a curriculum. And as Tamika said, you have this manual, you follow it, but you need to be open to adjust according to the class or the person. So I really love that openness to experimentation. Mm -hmm. uh, this round table came actually from a question from a practitioner called Walter Kwan that he said, you know, it's challenging to teach the Reiki symbols. So I want to bring like this very, like almost like practical detail, right? Like how can we apply experimentation language to teach something as difficult to perceive as a Reiki symbol? I struggled. I felt it was like a long distance phone number, like, oh, I'll dial the Reiki number one and get this kind mm -hmm. of energy, right? That's because my family lives in Europe. Obviously, please, people don't do that. But I'm thinking, and maybe it's not a Reiki symbol, but how can we bring this idea of experimentation to a very, uh, not, I'm, I cannot, don't have the word, to a, like one little thing that you, that you teach, like a practical example. Uh, the word is not coming in English. Sorry. <laughs> I like that you say practical, Natalie, because that's, I think, really the key um, for so many of us now. Like, and because, Reiki has become um, more popular and, you know, in a lot of ways, yes, it can cause confusion with all the different information out there, but the great thing is, is there's more conversation. So I think more people are trying to figure out how to make it more practical and how do we have these conversations in ways, um, just like Tamika said, how do we apply this into everyday life? And that's what the symbols are to me, I love the symbols actually, because I think of them almost as like a roadmap of how we um, come to discover our true nature. So I think the challenge with the symbols is one, really coming into relationship with each of them. But again, of course, I love the experimenting, meditating on them, seeing the texture, the feeling of them. So they're not just something that you draw or just something you invoke with, you know, the word or the chant or this, but what does the energy feel like? And what does it really point to in that pathway of embodiment? So I, I mean, do you mind go through the symbols or I don't know, but I just see them as like the sequential roadmap that, um, that also helps people to understand, oh, this is how it applies to me, not just in session and not just to use on someone else, but how does it apply? How does each assemble, each symbol support and apply to your personal path of healing, awakening, whatever it is that your goal is. So I like to look at them at really every aspect of Reiki of how does it support you? I love that answer. 
I, I think it's really, as you said, experimenting the vibration is, you know, and we're going back to that thread of practice and experimentation, which ironically, a lot of times are out of Reiki training. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Annie or Tamika, you want to build on that, and it can be a Reiki symbol or another element, but like bringing that very specificity, that was a word that was missing before, mm -hmm. of teaching one of the elements. Well, I, uh, I noticed that there are people who love symbols and there are people who love mantras. Yeah, there are people who love both, but mostly <laughs> people like either symbols or mantras. Um, but uh, for me, teaching both of them is, um, is like, I explain it often. I, I believe Franz uh, wrote this article and I love it as a martial arts practitioner. I love it. I say, I always say that both mantras and symbols are like the sword, which is there. If you keep it on the wall in a frame or not on, in a frame, just as a nice piece of decoration, it will do nothing. It will never become part of you. It will never unlock the potential that it's supposed to unlock or let you learn you who you are and let, let you whatever, be the tool. <clears throat> so the, the only thing is, to practice it and not everybody is uh, very uh, uh, perceives the, 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 the energy of it directly like very many women do but a lot of men say I don't feel anything but what they uh, in the end say okay it, it brings me it brings me peace it calms me down and that's what counts in the end right um, yeah this is, this is my practical uh, example. <laughs> no, but, but I think it's lovely. I think that image of the sword on the wall is very great, right? We can buy a Reiki one class, um, leave that certificate on the wall if we don't practice or Reiki mm. two with the symbols. They're just a sword on the wall, right? That wisdom is not gonna come to us. Tamika, how can you build on that? How, how is the challenge of like teaching symbols for your students? It's the simplicity of it. Um, you, when you, when, when introducing the symbols, they tend to want to overthink the symbols. They want to make sure they're, is it going to the left? How many circles do we go around? Where do I stop? How should I go? Am I going too fast? And then, then you bring them back into just breathe. <laughs> just breathe the breath and just breathe. Um, because that is it we are taught so much intricate parts of doing the symbols, but it brings us back into just be, just be. And when they begin to just breathe and they settle in, they find their rhythm, they find their tone, and then they embody it. So that's the beauty of it when I am really big on just like, dude, just chill, just breathe. <laughs> And when that happens, you see them unfold. You, you, you now have given them the power because it's not as if we are the healers. I don't want them to ever feel as if, if Tamika isn't around, I don't remember how to do this. I just have this paper in front of me, but I remember when she was there, we had this little cadence going on, and, but it's not me, it's you. So giving them the power to actually embody the symbols so when they use the symbols, they are the symbols, the symbols are them. That's lovely. And I'm going to build on you immediately because if there was one tip you could give a starting Reiki teacher, and it doesn't have to be about the symbols, but to teach, like, like what is the first thing you will sell someone who finished the Reiki tree and they have their little manual and they're going to face four <clears throat> people. And then hopefully if this is your first class, you are keeping it small. Uh, what will you tell what for that teacher, like in terms of, of the teaching, not the practical part that will go after? <laughs> Don't call me every time something come up now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just being honest. Um, because of that, the experiences. The one thing I honor about my master teacher is when I first uh, was Reiki one, <laughs> I was purging a lot of things. I went through the purging stage um, and I was like, what in the world is going on? You did not tell me this. This was not in the manual. Somebody needs to give me a refund because I didn't sign up for this. These are the experiences 
that no one can teach us or tell us about. And that part, when the Reiki student is complete, there is a trust that is needed. There's a trust of when things come up that they are coming up for you to sit with, to honor, and to just be still in that moment. Because that's one of the most beautiful things. When you open your eyes, I don't know how you all felt when you got your Reiki one attunement, but when I opened my eyes, there was like this new world. Everything seemed brighter, everything seemed clearer. But then when I walked out, things got real. And I wanted to call and I wanted that, that one person that I can be like, hey, look, there's some things going on here in this world. And I didn't know what to do, but there was a trust. So I always will share that with any Reiki student once they leave out of the presence of me, because sometimes they feel like they're in the bosom of big mama. Just know that you're always being held with that energy. And once again, giving them their power back, knowing that they've now tapped into this power that most of us have never even had a relationship with. So yeah, be still, be okay with honoring yourself. That's what I would share with the new Reiki master or Reiki student. Let me say that. No, I, I love that because I think ironically, as new Reiki teachers, we're so worried about doing the right thing that we like, it's hard to hold the space and create that trust in the first few rounds, right? So I think telling like Reiki master mm -hmm. is normal. Like you need to create a story, hold the space. It's more about your presence than going through the perfection of the manual. And also letting students what they can expect, like a more realistic. I have so many students that are like, I took a Ricky class and my life is still crappy. It's like, well, yeah, <laughs> you know, it's like, and Yolanda, I remember when we had the interview, you had a similar experience. We were like, what is this? The healing, right? So I guess if you can talk a little bit about that and also add your own tip for a new Reiki teacher. Yeah, I definitely um, making sure that they don't think they have to know everything <laughs> and that they don't think that they're responsible to the healing of their students or their clients for that matter, you know? Um, so I think that's, that's a really huge thing, taking the pressure off of thinking you have to know everything. No, um, I think it's great going in with the excitement, even as a teacher and knowing that you're going to learn from the students. Like that's, that's one of the best ways <laughs> to go into but I think the biggest thing is practice, really practice and pay attention to the way that the work is helping you transform. How does this work support you in your life? What are your real life experiences and expressions through this? Because the more you pay attention to your own experience through the journey of application, the more you're going to trust in what it is that you're sharing. So it's not that you feel like, oh, I have to memorize everything that's in my Reiki manual and oh, I have to, you know, all the pressure you can put on yourself. But if you are genuinely showing up in your practice, it's going to be very, very personal to you. And you will be, um, I think, more excited to share from that space of authenticity of why it matters to you. And there's a, I think there's just more of a gentleness and a calmness that comes with that instead of feeling like you have to show up as this Reiki master that knows everything and I can answer all the questions, like it's okay, <laughs> yeah. Like we're always learning. Um, and from Franz, definitely I learned have fun with it, you know, keep it lighthearted. And while the work is very serious and there's beautiful, you know, very serious components to it, it can still be lighthearted and fun. So be easy on yourself, be open to still learning as you're teaching and yeah. That's what I would tell them. <laughs> and that again, I, I love how you're able, both of you, to keep it very simple, but very. I wish I had heard this when I was started teaching, right? Like, I'm just gonna keep it at that because Annie is looking like she has something to add. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry, <laughs> Kathleen, I took the ball and I'm like, Phew! like, I need <laughs> no, I was, I was just thinking, um, I'm actually, uh. Of, of course, like Yolanda said, practice. That's what I al always tell. Don't, this is not a. This is not the end. It's just the beginning. Keep practicing, and it will keep unfolding. And you will. You will fall again, and you have to stand up. And yeah, a, a Reiki practice. I mean, being a master is not is not 
that you have accomplished something. It's okay, you have gotten gotten the tools to deal with the daily uh, shit that you will <laughs> come across and people and relationships and everything, everything. So I do let people know that they, uh, they can come back to me with questions and with everything, uh, not to not to take their power from them, but to, you know, be the listening ear sometimes. And of course, I encourage people to come back and uh, to, um, to, to cultivate a positive experience, to cultivate confidence. And that's, uh, that happens actually in, uh, within the, the group of people, within the uh, atmosphere of trust where people know each other, people can come and practice and, you know, practicing Reiju, practicing for the first, I remember I, uh, for the first time I had to do a, a treatment. I, and there was a man uh, sitting on a chair in front of me. I, I thought, I'm not going to touch that man. It was, it was just how, <laughs> but uh, yeah, this kind of, this kind of things. I mean, people have to get through the yeah, sometimes we have difficulties in, in inside, and we have to get through them. And this is how this is what I what I say. Okay, come back here. We have a Reiki share, Reiki evenings, Reiki practice evenings, and we practice together. And people love that coming. It's more, uh, you know, uni and coming back, coming back, talking about things, discussing and practicing together. I, I love what I hear and I'm just going to do a little recap. Like I love, again, holding the space is more important than going through the manual, right? And you said breathing to the Reiki students. I will say breathe to the teacher as well. Yeah. Perfection, that I think is a big, big one, right? And that's very linked, like hold the space, bringing your life and your practice into it. Uh, I think, as you said, like both all of you said, like, having a real life experience, give us the words. We're talking about the challenge of words at the beginning. The only way for me, like sometimes I feel is like, if you have that personal experience, when you talk from your experience and your words, people are more empathetic. They, they get it, right? Everybody understands like, they stole my bag in the subway. I was crying without money. I started doing Josh in Kokioho and I felt center again. Oh, that I want to do Josh in Kokioho versus you'll become one with the universe, which is beautiful. But for some people, maybe a little bit advanced. And as you all said, adjusting, right? If you have a crowd that is more advanced, then you may want to go to that universe. So I, I love what you said. But I think I hear from all of you is practice, not train for perception, an open mind, and always learn from training, but also from your students. So in a way, we're not the teacher giving. There is that beautiful give and take relationship that sometimes when we start, we don't like it because it makes us feel very insecure. We have to know everything, right? So I love that you bring it. And Anna, you gave me an opening to go to the second section because Reiki is very complex because beyond the very abstract and beautiful concept, there is the practical side. You need to teach people to place their hands on someone else. And how do you breathe, especially now in a moment of pandemic that, well, we are probably not giving a lot of classes, most of us. But it's still like, you don't know this person and you're supposed to put your hands with an open heart. But then your back hurts after 15 minutes. How do you please your legs? Not only that, if you live in New York, what kind of space can you rent? How do you get new students? Like there is, it's a really challenging profession, right? So what is the biggest practical challenge you found? And in my case, I can be very open. It was getting the space and getting students. I was completely lost. It happened by itself. But that for me was a very practical challenge that it took me like a few months to figure out. So I'm open who wants to start this thread. Hopefully you, you were more successful in the space part than I was. It took me a good while to find the right space in New York City. Oh God, you're looking at me like, I don't know. I'm like, okay, who's the least shy person? And actually Anya, since you put the practical hand of it, I'm starting with you. Well, I am, you know, when I was reading the list of questions you sent to us, I was thinking, okay, there are, there are for me, just like we practice with uh, body, mind, and energy, there are challenges on the levels of body, mind, and, challenge, uh, and, and, and energy. Uh, so for me, the, 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 the practical, the physical challenges are the, the body level. They are there, of course. 
energy is the the language part and, and and the mind part is how to teach not how to teach but how to teach well how do i really facilitate that so those are those are for me the three maybe just to name it to go top down and uh well yeah i was fortunate to have um, a place of my uh, to 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 have a place in my house to start a reiki uh, first time and then i moved and and then again <laughs> god blessed with a with a uh, with a place uh, where I could host everything and I'm really happy. Um, now I'm renting it, but uh, financial challenges, okay, how, I, how do I solve it? I, I invite another group of people who go do, uh, if you know, biodanza or whatever, uh, other people, you know, sharing the, sharing the costs together. Students, yes. It's, it's a big challenge because then you need to put yourself out in, uh, on the marketplace. And how do you do that? Yes, you have to be you. <laughs> and who am I? What am I? What are my strengths? <laughs> what are my weaknesses? Yeah, it takes a lot of self-knowledge. So it's a process. And that process helps me to polish myself. So it's, it's chicken and egg. It's never about me putting it out there. It's, it's me searching for what am I? What can I offer? In which way? How? Practically? You know, all that stuff. A bit too much, but <laughs> in a nutshell. <laughs> but they loved it because even the practical challenges end up being spiritual challenges, right? True. Like, at the end, True. like it's all about growth. Like teaching is not like I made it and teaching. Every challenge we feel like, oh my God, and we try to solve it in a practical way. But as you said, when we have to put ourselves out there, Mm -hmm. And that isn't always easy for all of us, right? And how authentic are we coming across? Or are we just playing the Reiki playbook, right? Of what is supposed to be a Reiki teacher. So Yolanda, build on that. I'm throwing the ball to you now. I'm like, and I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. the recording, you're gonna be different different place. Like I'm throwing it where you are now. So it's gonna be funny <laughs> what <watching>, like <laughs> you're <both> nowhere. <laughs> yeah, I um the challenges at first, well I, it, the challenges at first were really just, you know, the confidence in it of like, wow, am I ready for this? Am I ready to teach? I was very fortunate in that I was practicing on my friends and anyone who would allow it. And so my first um, students were referrals from people that I knew. And like Anya, um, initially I had room in my home. And so, you know, there was that I was fortunate again that the people were referred by people I knew. And so um, I felt comfortable with them coming into my home. There was also a time where I did rent space and you know that was okay. But the bigger challenge now is because of COVID because I have chosen to only teach Reiki in person. And so I haven't taught a Reiki class um, like a proper Reiki class uh, since what the last two years. So I had to adapt though what I was doing because I love the teachings and I wanted to, part of te teaching in of itself is part of my own practice. And so I decided to create a group where I can meet with other practitioners online and we practice Reiki together. So it's, you know, Reiki classes in a way, <laughs> but everyone is already attuned and it's not formalized class but that's how I have um given myself the opportunity to teach during the pandemic but yeah I, it has been very challenging and I can't wait to open up to having in-person sessions and classes again me too it's I think I thought like a couple and then I had to close down again with Omicron and I'm not opening for a good while so, yeah so but that's just Teaching is your spiritual practice, right? So these challenges feed that. And yes, I think sometimes we get frustrated as teachers, things don't go the way we want. Oh, I was starting to teach and then the pandemic came. And yes, please complain for two hours. But at the end, <laughs> all the space for that. And it's like, what is this supposed? How can this help me grow as a teacher, right? Yeah. And you said you will not have perhaps tried something different if not. Yeah. And I think it's a, a really big thing for when people want to or decide to teach, thinking about the format that would work best for them, you know, is it more practical for you to rent a space? Is it more practical for you if you're choosing to teach online? And then which elements would support 
the format that you're allowed or that you have to teach because even um, teaching in person versus holding space online, there's a difference, you know? So there are some things you have to consider in terms of connection and how you can really bring the group in and make sure people still have um, the type of experience that you would like to hold, <laughs> whether you're doing it in person or not. I love that. And, and again, experimentation is coming, right? Self-exploration, yeah. experimentation, keeping that, always that mind and heart open. I love that. Tamika, you're looking like you want to add something. So I, um, I am in a space where I have a different challenge because I have a wellness center. Um, my challenge is once I put the word out, can I keep up with the amount of people who come in? <laughs> um, I am the only wellness center on my side of this space. And with the ability to speak and the faucets turn on and they flow in, I have this need to now step out of the position of always providing Reiki services and sessions and moving more into now attuning more Reiki teachers. Um, that's a challenge for me because being in this wellness space and being a wellness coach, um, I run into that wanting to always provide sessions. So now my challenge is being more into the space of teaching um, because I have to do that at this time to be able to give myself more um, time to expand as well as a teacher. Because if I continue to um, go into the space of offering sessions, 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 like we spoke about earlier, um, now I open myself up to now more students. Now I have 100 students, I mean 100 sessions versus maybe focusing on five teachers. So I, that makes sense. So um, that's my balance and that's my challenge. And that's where... Um, the shift has taken place now. So I came into this thing always having enough to be able to provide a space, having it at home and also having another master teacher allowing me to teach in that facility as well. So um, the balance is key for me. I, 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 I hear like keeping your balance. And also I think I will add like respecting, and you said like finding that balance, that personal balance, I think sometimes we need to remember we need to be in a good space ourselves to be able to teach. So if the conditions are not right for teaching, we also need to let go, right? Or in your case, the conditions, like you need to let go of sessions to be able to teach more so there are more practitioners available to serve those people who need it. So I think that ability of letting go is also very important and to flow in a way with craziness, right? We have COVID, in your case, you have the opposite. You have a bunch of people who need it and you cannot do it yourself. But it's really how do we step away from that ego side and like let go of some stuff and actually grow from all of these, right? Because at the end, as I mentioned, practical challenges are about our growth as well. Uh, I will add just as a tip, and then I want to hear your own tip for me, what really helped me also, like as it was running like a couple of beta classes. Uh, I Some of them were like by donation with small groups. And that gave me the confidence to teach. Like, I'm like, how am I going to teach people? I don't even know. So for me, like that really worked. I took a bunch of friends who wanted to study Reiki. They donated money. And that money actually went to train other Reiki teachers, people who wanted to be Reiki teachers. And I run a couple of beta classes. And I did learn a lot of what not to do. And I learned that what not to do is as important of learning what to do. Like, you know, we have to be open when we make a mistake in class. It's like, oh my God, thank God I did it. Now I won't do it again, right? Instead of bad, naughty. So <laughs> running a couple of beta classes uh, with people you know, or friends of friends and keeping them very small at the beginning. Don't go for 25 people on your first Reiki class if you can. So I don't know if anyone wants to build up on a tip also from the practical side of it. I love that. I actually recommend that to people all the time. Have some mock classes for family, friends, people who are close to you so that you can get a feel for it. Because you can't imagine what it's going to be like teaching Reiki um, until you actually do. A lot of times you don't even realize what you know or what you think about the practice until you're asked 
questions that maybe you hadn't considered. So it's a lot of fun to do it that way, um, to have the mock sessions, I think is a beautiful idea. Um, another thing too, is that the intimacy of the class, you know, it's, it's not to judge yourself for having small classes. I think sometimes people have the expectation of like, oh no, there's only two students. What do you mean only? <laughs> That's what a gift that you get to offer and share, you know, no matter who is able to show up. And I personally enjoy the smaller classes because it is more intimate and, you know, um, you have more ability to be more direct, but, you know, big classes are fine too but making sure that there's no expectation on yourself that you have to have 20 people in order for the class to be a success. I, I love that because I, I went through that judgment myself until I realized I actually don't like teaching big groups. Like <laughs> I actually, no, I kept my classes at four. It's like, I actually, and I don't think we all are very different, right? Right. And that it took me like a couple of years to feel like I actually like small groups, right? So why will I push something just because? And I always say like sometimes I have to stop like don't judge my spiritual practice for the business results or the Instagram likes, right? And that I think is part is a very practical part that we judge it because of those things. Uh, who wants to add to that? And let, you're both looking like we want to talk. We want to talk. Can I? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, um, yeah, about big or small classes, I think we all have expectations of ourselves that, yeah, we will go because we've been to the class and it was mostly more than two people. And, and you think, yeah, I've seen that. I know how it works, so I can do it. But uh -uh, not always. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the funny thing is that here comes my martial side again and where you read in every martial arts book uh, if you if you learn how to do one technique or one cut with a sword you will know it all so if you <laughs> practice enough one-on-one -on -one or, or in a small group it's it's then then a bigger group will be you know just a matter of splitting people up uh, so uh, it yeah i think we should in, indeed i really like this idea that uh we should start really really slow and not that I you know when you start I, I, I don't think it ever happens I, I at least I never met anybody who just started teaching and immediately got big classes I never met somebody like that I mean it goes organically you start small and then you probably grow but at, at this point I also I agree small group is is great and I enjoy even when I have just one some somebody who just signs up for the class just one person I will always let I will always give the class I will never say no it's not enough because it and it turns out always turns out to be magical to be so beautiful because you connect so deep I love it yeah yeah no it's I and I love that you pointed out it's true most people don't you may have the expectation that you put that class on Evan Bright here in the US it's like an event page Mm -hmm. And I, we always expect it like we put 20 tickets. I, I never put that because they don't fit in New York spaces. But actually, as you said, like, and also knowing that the people who reach you are the people meant for you to take yeah, time, true. right? Having that trust, like there is a reason why there is a flow to it. And the more we surrender, then we allow the flow to grow versus if we resent it, then we go nowhere. Tamika, you're nodding, you're nodding. No, I'm, I'm just... I honor the, the responses because it was at a time where you felt as if you needed to offer it to the collective and open it up. And no matter if you could fit 10 people, you wanted to make sure anyone could get in. Um, that changes because you begin to honor yourself and your energy as well. And um, I was at a we did a restorative Reiki session um, and it was my first time experiencing what it was to be in a room with 20 people sharing Reiki with my master teacher. And the for myself, the immense heat, the immense energy that arose, that was something I didn't want to touch ever again um, because it put me on my bottom for about two days. And so with me, I know what happens when the channeling and when energy starts to flow. So respecting the smaller spaces, not only it 
I'm always about self and not being selfish. But I'm like, honey, I'm not about to make myself get sick because I want to serve this entire group who's going to show up. And no matter if they're in a large group or a smaller group, the, the energy is going to be um, exchanged no matter what. So um, I want to make sure I honor that space and honoring those who are coming into the system, who are being introduced into the system, because I only know intimate settings when it came to this. Um, so I share from a different space. I've never had this huge class. I've only had two other students who were in a class with me at times. Um, that's how we are. And I honor that because I believe that's where you get the experience. And the experience is how you expand upon your knowledge and wanting to keep it up every day. I love that. And you said a word that is very important, honesty and self-care. So that's two words. But we need to be also very honest where we are in our journey as a teacher, right? Like, and very honest how we are handling it ourselves in terms of our energy, our well being, and that has to come first. So I really appreciate that because also in these times, you know, I grew up in a freaking crazy country, right? Like, I grew up with Molotovs and bombs and F 16s. These times make my upbringing look like it was going to the circus, right? So we also, as teachers, Perhaps we need to be honest, how much can we do? And when the world goes a bit crazy to really take care and perhaps go down or up with our classes, but understand that sometimes, you know, we need to be honest of where we are, like either with the way we like to teach also that sometimes we may have had big classes, but the world is in a different state or we are in a different state and we need to take care, perhaps teach less, teach more to be able to adjust, right? So we always go back to those things of honesty with self, self-exploration, uh, letting go and adjusting, right? That exploration and adjusting that came from the beginning, adjusting to our students, adjusting to conditions. I love that. And now, because I really like, and we always were laughing about keeping it real when we started, we're keeping it real. So I want you to, each of you share like one of the biggest oops teaching uh, that actually ended up like being, thank God I make that oops because it really allowed me to become a much better teacher. I have too many to start, so go ahead, whoever is. Or I'll share mine, which is very shameful. <laughs> okay, I'll share mine so that you lose, like you're like being shy. So I think my biggest mistake as a teacher, there were many, I think with thinking people will learn the same way I did. So I will, and I'm very verbal. Yes, I'm very mm -hmm. visual too, but I'm also very, I really, when people talk, I, I include in the body, like I learn things through words and emotions. So I basically went into class like, <laughs> and brushing and cramming a lot of information. Blah, blah, blah. And people left my class very confused and thought it was a better class. So I, I learned like, first of all, talk less, be more silent, but also understand everybody learns very differently. I cannot be a teacher who's like Berborea all the time, right? Like it was the biggest slap. And I'm really grateful at that class, I didn't stop talking for four hours because I learned not to do that. So, you know, anyone else had one like that or? I still talk a lot. <laughs> I think the biggest challenge for me um, in a class, although, I don't know, it's, it, it came up one time. Um, well, I guess it's all over the place, but there are sometimes um, conflicts and personalities within a class, you know? Yeah. And yeah, I've had experiences at, at least once um, where it's very obvious there was tension between two of the students. It was a very awkward thing because like on one hand, you know, you're holding space for everyone and you want everyone to, you know, feel comfortable and relaxed and in that safe space, but also addressing and diffusing the tension without calling people out necessarily. So that was, um, that was really interesting. In hindsight, I think, you know, I did the best that I could in that moment, but I think I would have going back to that um, even on a break, just having a side conversation to see, check in, how are you feeling? What's coming up for you? You know, that type of thing. So I think um, that was one of the biggest lessons is, 
I mean, you really do have to be engaged with the entire class as a whole, but also really seeing what's going on with people individually and their comfort levels and these types of things. So just having a mindfulness of how people may be feeling in the space, even on an individual level, if you may need to check in with them on a break or that type of thing, um, definitely was a, a big lesson. I love that because you said it, I'm like, oh my God, that happens so often. That's like not once or twice. And then you need to decide who those hands on healing and who. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> because at the end, those people have to touch, right? So yeah, yeah. That, that is a great one. Like, thank you for bringing that out. Yeah, that's true. Who else has a big oops? I think, yeah, I think my big loops yet has to come, but I, I keep making them. I keep making them. And uh, just to call it a huge, <laughs> probably again, it has to come yet, but I, I keep making mistakes in communication, in how I um, explain things. And th th that's what I, you know, when I reflect. Um, Sometimes I give, also I speak too much, I think. Um, I am, for a long time, I have been pretty tense and anxious about Reju because there's quite a lot of expectation about that initiation, Reju. And then you used to talk a lot about it before and then to build up, it turned out, build, build up even more expectations. <laughs> I, I thought I was taking them away, but no, <laughs> the other way around. So that I also learned to just, he said, you know, at, at this point I say, okay, this is like sunset. I can show it to you. You can say, wow, or you can just walk, <laughs> walk past it and say, yeah, that's something I see every day. Um, something like this. Yeah. What, what else? Oh yeah. Also on a very practical level, uh, at, at, in, in one class, I, I also um, do my own lunch. <clears throat> I ask people to bring some things, but I also bring soup and you know bread. And <laughs> in one course, I uh, just, you know, for three days, I made my bread, I, I used a different uh, stove. So I made my bread go <laughs> not <laughs> eatable. <laughs> I mean, this kind of oops, but uh, what I'm learning from all that, I mean, all these things, and then you have a day which is like, wow, and you feel wow at the end of the day, and I think, oh, I did great, I can do it, and the next day, the same people, same class, mm, mm. Some, something didn't click, somewhere it went wrong, but what I'm learning from them is like, uh, not to beat, beat myself up, I mean, it's, it's what it is. You learn from it and hopefully you will not make that mistake again or you will find out why this or that went wrong. And um, next time or, do it better. Or that time. they didn't do any wrong and they were not in the right space themselves, right? Like, and I think I, I love to call them mistakes with quote marks and oops, because again, you were, I think you were all mentioning we're not perfect as teachers, right? We will always make something but if we pay attention to it, we can learn, right? But we need to be open to making them. Like the bread mm -hmm. is like, okay, that is a very practical one, but it's true. Like little details matter, like mm -hmm. having tea or water available, making sure you have a bathroom available, right? So those little details like do matter. So we learn from them and everything is like an adjustment and a growth, but mm -hmm. we need to be open to have these oops. And as you say, sometimes we can do the best and people will be fighting. And, or they are not in the mood, you know, they're like a partner, like you can hold the space, you can put yourself like super pretty, but you know, you can do that much. You're not in control. It's like a session. Teaching is a little bit like a session. You can offer the healing, but if the person is not open to it, you know, you just need to relax. And that's where we grow as teachers. Like, okay, this is going to be one of those groups where they're going <laughs> with the head. Can I help them the most I can? And that's it, right? So yeah. Tamika, you're again, I love when you start nodding. I'm because sorry. I'm over here in my own space. Um, <laughs> no, it's because the one thing um, for, for myself is because when people come in, they come in for one or two reasons to, to, to come in and they're introduced to Reiki. For one, like I said, they are having the spiritual awakening and they are 
on this quest to find themselves and connect back with source energy. Um, and so they come in and they, they are, they're learning the manual, but then the life experiences will come in and the stories start coming in. And then now we've gone off track because the experiences and everybody wants to tell the story. And I'm like, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like really back in and my my husband always says he's the great cutoff person he was like um he'll cut it off so great and I don't know how to do that because I want to honor their space so I'm like okay 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 and then yeah so it turns into this full um discussion of self and it gets them off topic of the actual sessions or either the precepts or and the precepts are usually what happens when we when we introduce the precepts and it's like oh well you know what I can use just for today I won't be angry and let me tell you about the time I can it's like oh boy <laughs> so yes yeah, that's, that's very something. true very true <laughs> no, we're all smiling because I think the trail is like yeah yeah, yeah very it's true. a hard one yeah 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 yeah, but it's again, again, how to be, you know, this leadership. How do you pull that out? <laughs> yeah, that part. <laughs> Honoring and kind. Yeah, that that first. Yeah, as you said, like you learn, but it's a hard one. And mm -hmm. I think scheduling less, teaching more time usually helps a little bit. But yeah, like bringing them on track, it takes takes a little bit of practice. <laughs> <laughs> it does. <laughs> Oh my God, I want to thank you so much. So I, I just want to do a final round of anything that comes to your mind that you would like to share for people who are teaching Reiki. And when I think of teaching, I'm almost not teaching either because I, I do prefer in person. I've explored online. I'm like, yeah, that doesn't feel right to me. Uh, but, you know, but all of you have had experience a lot of teaching either in person, either in the little COVID or before COVID or hopefully soon. So maybe one thing that comes to mind that you want to share as a closing round for this round table. I just would go back to don't put too much pressure on yourself. <laughs> don't take yourself too seriously. Um, there are going to be bumps and bruises along the way, but if you have that openness of knowing, it's I'm going to learn from this. I'm going to learn from this. I also think remembering your why, why it even matters to you, why you love this so much that you even want to share it. Like let that motivation keep driving you forward. But definitely don't be too hard on yourself and know that I mean, everything, you'll figure it out. <laughs> you'll figure it out. You'll learn, you'll grow. And the path is always changing. So it just, it is, oh, and don't compare yourself to other people. Don't worry about it. Show up as you. Show up as you. It's the best you can do. That is a big one. Yes. Absolutely. I, I agree 100%. Yeah, because I was, I was also first thing that came up to me to my mind was practice, keep practicing, keep finding that motivation. Because when you are motivated, you can motivate others. Otherwise, it doesn't work. And also, in, in, indeed, do not take yourself too serious, but also do not be too much of a holy person you know it's still it's still uh, life is still full of very difficult situations and even if you are a, a, a reiki master with zillions of years of experience you can still fall so deep and uh, allow yourself that i mean yeah i think that and to and, and see what you learn from that yeah also you create very like not real expectations like if you're this person who's never angry and worry yeah. people will get very frustrated with their practice right like no here i'm natalie i'm always smiling like yeah no <laughs> because it, it's, it's unattainable for anyone right we become so that is a big point i'm loving this yeah mika so what i would share what i always so so i ground myself with this affirmation and it's you get to choose to make your life simply powerful it's those words that got me through some of the most treacherous times in my life when I came to this connection and this relationship with Reiki. It was those moments where everything seemed so chaotic throughout the changes of my life that I was able to ground myself with the simple, the simple aspects of why I love Reiki. And they were so powerful. So I asked each and every person when they leave the presence 
and they are in this quest to evolve their energy in their life, just to make it simple. Because in those simple moments is where our power resides. In those simple moments is where we continue to kick down those doors of things that no longer serve us. It's in those simple moments that we can truly share and be. Share and just be. Be and share and breathe, honey. That's mm -hmm. all. <laughs> oh my God. And you said it beautifully and you can talk to me for hours. I'm bringing you to New York so you can talk to me and like with the rhythm, like amazing. Uh, there are no words to express my gratitude to you three uh, for being willing to, to come to the first round table, to bear with my time experimenting here. I think your wisdom has been amazing. So there are no words really to express my gratitude. And I don't know, I'll have to say goodbye, but I don't want to say goodbye. I don't want to let you know <laughs> any of you. Uh, and for the people watching this, we're going to have uh, round tables every three months. The first one is going to be actually talking about the business side and the marketing side. And that's going to be in June. And in September, it will be the challenge about writing books and Reiki books and really about bringing it into words, which we were talking here. Like one thing is words we say in a class, but when we have to put those words forever on paper or Kindle, uh, what is the challenge? So there's going to be every three months. And I can't wait to share more. Uh, Anya, Yolanda, Tamika, really my heart is just full. So thank you very much. To reach each of you, I'm gonna actually add all the links. Uh, perhaps the last thing, and I know it's the last thing, is there a project that you wanna highlight that you're doing right now, very shortly? And also I'll add your personal links to your Facebook, your website, your Instagram, or anything you wanna highlight. So go ahead. And this time we're going the opposite. We're starting Tamika, Yolanda, Anya. <laughs> Awesome. So I am working on just continuing to expand and open it up for more Reiki teachers to come on to be able to share in this beautiful love, this beautiful light that we all are a part of in this evolution. So to connect with me at any platform, Facebook, Instagram, even TikTok, y'all, energy, evolution, SC, yes, I'm working on this thing. These young folk got me because, you know, they are also our future. And to be able to share this is also another impactful thing that I'm working on, just to bring more families into Reiki. So mm -hmm. any families, any moms and children who are out there seeking guidance into not only the moms and the and the dads being um, Reiki attuned, but also bringing the children aboard because now it's a holistic approach to Reiki. So energyevolutionsc.com is my website and find me on any platform with that same handle. Thank you so much. Following you on TikTok, you'll be the first Reiki master I'm following because most of them <laughs> just do these. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting there. <laughs> Yolanda. You like I'm so year. behind. I don't have TikTok. Um, I want to thank you first so much, Natalie, for having me and for meeting both of you. This has been a lot of fun. Um, I will be starting season nine of Reiki Radio again soon, and I hope you'll come back for season nine, Natalie. Um, so looking forward to that. I also have finally completed a two-year project of an Oracle deck <laughs> that has been inspired by um, my practice, the people I work with, all of the things. So um, the printing for that starts next week. So you can learn more about that and my podcast on my website, which is theenergeticalchemist.com. Um, I'm not that active on social media, but if you like it, Instagram, I'm just at Reiki Radio. Uh, yeah, and I love, love going deeper into the practice with people who are already practitioners, especially since I'm not teaching Reiki at this time. So if you would like to connect with me for that. I would love to meet you. Thank you. I'm Thank still you. waiting for that Oracle. Like I'm waiting for the pre-sale to hit Amazon, buy it. So I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Anya, anything you would like to share? Sounds very well. I, I also want to thank you all for uh, Natalie for inviting and, and you two for uh, for being there and for sharing your uh, experience and wisdom and I, I loved I loved hearing and you know recognizing myself in your stories it's always great always great to find the you know to, to find the, the, the points to con connecting and um, um, special projects my at, at this moment my special project which is not uh, which is not commercial is like I started teaching English here <laughs> and I'm kind of 
I started teaching to the to the high school uh, students and I'm kind of thinking okay I can bring my Reiki ideas into into the world to the real world you know <laughs> that is at this point something which is uh, keeping me busy busy um, and uh, on the other hand for people who would like to practice in Dutch because mostly I teach in Dutch I do provide uh, Reiki shares in Dutch online once a month and uh, I run Reiki shares physically here in the beautiful eastern part of Holland. You can uh, find me on Instagram and Facebook. Probably Natalie will post the link. With all the links. And I, I still have to, to make that TikTok account. <laughs> <laughs> like I think yeah, yeah, like you're opening your roads. Like I'm like already like reels. I'm like, I don't have time to do reels. I think I'll do reels first. Actually, I can share them on TikTok. Oh, you're inspiring. <laughs> you see, you're inspiring us. We're gonna be TikTok things. Meanwhile, I don't recommend you to watch most breaky TikTokers with the music and the lights going like this. But unless it relaxes you, you know, like an ASMR. But so thank you, thank you so much, ladies. And for everyone who's watching this, big, big love and light. And see you on the next episode. Ciao. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.